Just a little bit of silence and the different faiths represented here, people from all walks of lives, lives, every shade, every color, every culture. We just want to have a moment of reflection right now. I'm just going to pray as I do my tradition. God of all creation, we ascribe to you tonight, Father, that you may look down upon your people, not only in this place, but in the streets of this community, in the streets and the roads of this nation, that you, O oh God, today would speak clearly, Lord, to the issues that are at hand. We know that you, in history, have always sided with the worker, have always sided on justice, has always sided on the, on the side of the poor. And tonight, O oh God, we lift up the cries of your people, the cries of the working man and the working woman that deserves a fair shake. And we know the opposition that we have before us, but we know that we serve a God of power and a God of might and a God of justice. And we pray that your justice, that your shalom, O oh God, would be upon us, would be breathed into whatever legislation you desire that would work for us. Legislation, O oh God, that would be mindful of the poor, mindful of the working man and woman. Legislation, O oh God, that takes the, the interests, O oh God, of, of those that are the neediest in our communities. Lord, we believe that you can change this economy. We believe that you can change, O oh God, what man says cannot be changed. We believe in that God of creation. And tonight we pray for your blessing upon this time, upon your people, and that your justice would flow like a mighty river, like the prophet Amos said, in a never-ending stream. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for coming today. Uh, my name is Pete Sikora, and I am with the Communications Workers of America. We're a labor union fighting Fast Track and the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, and we're going to have an agenda here until about 7.30. Uh, so uh, before introducing our keynote speaker, and I have to say, I'm not usually as nervous at these events as I am here. I'm a gigantic admirer of Professor Stiglitz's. And just having him here in Jackson Heights is just a tremendous lift to our efforts. I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, truth really spoken to power from, uh, from the professor and his perspective on this. But before we get to that, I wanted to frame uh, the issue. We're going to have uh, a bunch of local speakers uh, from the communities and from different advocacy groups who will address particular aspects of this issue. Um, but the Trans-Pacific Partnership, you can see right up there, uh, it's a gigantic deal. It covers 12 different countries on the Pacific Rim, and it's structured as a docking agreement, which means that besides just Mexico, US, the Canada, Japan, Australia, Malaysia, Vietnam, that once it's passed, other countries could also join in. So a deal that currently covers 40% of the world economy, which is a gigantic deal, would become even larger when China comes into it. Um, that's what's at stake here, the rules that affect all 12 countries and potentially the entire globe here. Um, the Trans-Pacific Partnership is being negotiated entirely in secret, behind closed doors. Uh, the only people who have access to the texts are the country's negotiators themselves and 600 corporate advisors and a tiny little handful of good guy groups who have confidenti confid confidentiality agreements uh, signed. Um, the thing to realize about the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, that Professor Siglitz will elaborate on is it's actually not primarily about trade. Um, we think of trade as borders and customs and things uh, affecting uh, tangible goods. But that's the very minority of this agreement. Most of the agreement, and we're told it's roughly 12,000 pages long at this point, uh, over 23 chapters in it, um, covers everything from how to make it easier to outsource jobs and move jobs across borders, pushing down wages and standards, 
um, and allowing corporations, multinational corporations, to sue national, state, and local governments to overturn laws that violate the treaty and that, and this is the term of art in the actual treaty itself, impede their expected future profits. Um, the TPP thus covers everything from the safety of our food, air and water quality, climate change, ra it'll raise prescription drug prices, and take away a lot of the even way too weak regulations that restrain Wall Street banks from wrecking the economy and, and hurting consumers. It affects a very, very wide range of issues, but uh, some of them are covered right up there. Um, as for jobs, we've seen this movie before. Um, the TPP is like NAFTA on steroids. Um, this is a chart of the over 700,000 jobs that were lost by 2010 thanks to NAFTA. By state, you can see how many were lost as a percentage of the total job base there. The black is 1% of jobs in that state. 700,000 jobs. Um, that's NAFTA. The Korea trade deal, which just passed and has uh, now been in force, was sold just like NAFTA. It's going to create jobs. It's going to raise standards. We're going to have a bigger economy and everyone's going to benefit. Um, but so it was supposed to create 40,000 jobs. Since then, we've lost 70,000 jobs as the deficit with Korea has exploded. Um, that's, the, that's the history. My union, we represent call center workers, manufacturing workers. We've seen half a million call center jobs go overseas. Over a thousand from New York State, from just one company, Verizon, alone from New York State as a result of these trade deals, greased skids for, uh, for outsourcing. Manufacturing has lost over five million jobs, but it's not just about manufacturing or call center jobs anymore. Everything from medical imaging to back office work can be outsourced. Economists estimate, estimate that roughly 20% of jobs can actually be outsourced at this point. So here's a, a slide that's interesting. Um, this is probably what you're feeling at work. That top line there is productivity um, after World War II. You can see it's going up and up and up and up very, very rapidly. Um, but then that red line there, that's real average weekly wages. And you can see that through the 70s, those things were actually tied together. As productivity increased, so did average wages. Well, they started diverting as this regime and other factors started to come into play. And so all of that productivity increase that's missing there has been funneled somewhere else. So um, this is a slide. I'm a, I'm a union speaker. A lot of you are, are, are union members, but I think it's interesting for non-union members also. Those two lines track the share of middle class income and the share and the percentage of unionized workers in, uh, in this country. Both are going down very, very fast. Um, just to dramatize it even more, this is the percentage by state of union workers in each state. This was in 1964, and the darkest there is over 30% labor union members in a, in a state. So, and then the white uh, was 0 to 9%. It doesn't really show up here, but only North Carolina was white at that point. Um, so it was on, under 10% union density. That's 1964. This is 1974, this is 1984, this is 1994, this is 2004, and that's 2010. So that's what's happening to union members and the middle class in this country. New York is a little bit of an island. I don't know why Alaska is so big, maybe oil workers or something, I don't know. But uh, it's an Alaskan there, I think. All right, big ups to Alaska. Okay, so um, going into the politics here, um, as union membership drops and as the middle class faces pressures downwards from these kinds of trade treaties, um, there's an enormous amount of pressure on wages and standards. Um, it creates a push downwards. On that productivity slide, I bet everyone feels like if, if you're working, some of us are retired, I'm, you know, I look forward to that day, but um, you're probably working harder than ever. You're probably more productive than ever but you're not feeling the benefits of that productivity, that's going somewhere else. And where it's going is the top 1%. Um, that's who this treaty is about. about uh, uh, it's for benefiting a global elite and structuring things so that it works for them. Now, this is the politics on this issue. Um, I want to spend two minutes on it, and then we'll introduce our first speaker. Um, it's, an, it's, it's not your usual uh, alliance here. Um, unfortunately, 
Um, the Obama administration, the Republican leader, John Boehner, and the Senate Republican leader, Mitch McConnell, are in an alliance here to move fast track and the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, and the president is fantastic on most of our issues that, that many of us in this room care about. And there are big differences between him and uh, the people that, that are on the other side of the aisle. But on this issue, there's actually not that much difference, uh, which is a big disappointment. Um, ultimately, the treaty here is for, for folks that are not, not working class people. Um, there, it's really for the top 1%. Here are some, some famous folks from some banks and a, and a super yacht. Um, so um, getting to the process of what will happen here, the 12 country negotiations are incredibly complicated. They're behind closed doors. It's an enormously complex, roughly 12,000 page agreement. What we know about it is only through leaks supplied by WikiLeaks and, and, and other people kind of leaking information out of school. Um, in order to finish those negotiations and pass the deal, first they need a procedure to pass in Congress called Fast Track. Um, the other side calls this Trade Promotion Authority. What Fast Track is, is it surrenders Congress's constitutional ability to negotiate foreign trade deals and hands that negotiation authority to the president, who then is able to present an agreement to Congress for an up or down vote with very limited debate and no opportunity for amendments. And get this, everything that then is passed in that treaty that conflicts with US law, according to Fast Track, it automatically will, will override US law. So in order to pass the agreement, they first need to pass Fast Track. And then they can pass the TPP. Politically, the fight is over Fast Track. If Fast Track passes, it's likely that the TPP will pass a, a few months later. Um, so right now where we're at politically is actually not bad. They were supposed to have passed Fast Track uh, last year, but the groups in this room who are putting on this event have successfully held it off. Um, and so now with the Senate flipping, unfortunately, to, to, to uh, Mitch McConnell's control and Republican control, it's no longer really that hard for them to move it through the Senate. So the fight, which we always knew would be in the House of Representatives, is on right now. What they need to do is pass fast track in the next few months. Their agenda is to move it in committee, in the Senate committee, which is the Finance Committee. They wanted to introduce it this week. Doesn't seem like they're able to put it together this week. Maybe it'll be introduced next week. They want to move it first through the Senate and then move it through the House. First it would pass in the Ways and Means Committee and then it would go to a floor vote. Our goal is to prevent that floor vote from happening. Now the committee that it's gonna go through would be the Ways and Means Committee. And that's where Representative Crowley comes in and why he's so incredibly important uh, on this issue. Not, he's not just House leadership, but he's also uh, a member of the All Important Ways and Means Committee on this issue. So here's where we're at in New York State. Um, the Republicans, three of them support Fast Track, Two New York State Republicans oppose fast track. Three are, are undecided. We don't know where they stand. Virtually all New York State Democrats are against fast track and have said so publicly. Um, Greg Meeks from Southeast Queens and a little bit of Nassau County is the only Democrat from New York State who openly supports fast track legislation. He just went on a junket uh, overseas with Paul Ryan, the chair of the Ways and Means Committee, former vice presidential candidate, uh, to promote the TPP. Um, Joe Crowley uh, and Charles Rangel are both Democrats. They're both on the Ways and Means Committee. Neither has uh, yet declared for our side. Now here's the good news. Representative Crowley has repeatedly stood with working people and the environment and food safety over and over and over again. He's voted against fast track legislation before. What we want him to do is to come out now and say that he's a no vote on fast track. He will not accept that legislation. That would send a very big message to the rest of the House, particularly Democrats in the House who are needed to pass this agreement. We really need Representative Crowley to step up and once again support working people by voting against fast track, thus preventing the TPP from passing. Um, so that's the politics of this issue. Now, that took a lot of work in our coalition to get where we're at today, um, to hold up this treaty and keep it from passing, but we're not alone. Um, this is a global opposition and it's becoming more and more and more of an issue. Um, so with that having been said, um, I want to introduce our first speaker. 
Um, Professor uh, Joseph Stiglitz is, um, I'm going to gush a little bit here. I apologize, um, but uh, the professor is, uh, is, is a Nobel laureate, uh, which is a big deal. Uh, it really elevates your, your, uh, your stature, I've heard. Um, he's won the John Bates Clark Medal. He's a university professor at Columbia. He's the fourth most cited academic economist in the world today. Um, he's on countless panels, um, and he's here tonight with us. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of an amazing thing because, you know, I've never introduced anybody I admire as much and has as much influence as, uh, as Professor Stiglitz. Um, the economics profession is, um, much like any other profession, sometimes has, I, I suspect, conformity pressures. And in the economics profession, when you get to a very high level, you know, you, if you go along to get along with the Jamie Dimons and the Walmarts of the world and the the, the big money players, you know, you, you, can, you can do pretty well. You can get nice consulting contracts, you get invited on private yachts. You know, I, I, I suspect there's a lot of, you know, subtle and perhaps unsubtle uh, pressure on economists, particularly at a high level, to, to, to kind of tow the neoliberal consensus line. Um, but Professor Siglitz not only has uh, bucked that pressure, um, he is a just gigantic figure as an activist. Um, there's very few academics who are able to influence the public policy debate uh, in this country and overseas in a very substantial way. Um, but Professor Stiglitz has been able to do that uh, as, an, as an academic, um, but really as an activist uh, in my uh, very positive uh, sense of that word. Um, Time Magazine named him one of the 100 most influential people in the world. Uh, it gives me great pleasure, uh, pleasure to introduce Professor Joseph Stiglitz. Well, thank you very much for that introduction and for that reception. Uh, this is a really important issue, and I, I, I think uh, uh, he's only just begun to describe why uh, this is such an important issue. One of the reasons you should know it's important uh, is that they've tried to get it passed without anybody knowing it. Uh, and, and, and that should make you uh, uh, suspicious. Um, the second thing that they always say about these agreements is that they're going to create jobs. Now, it's a very curious thing. If that were really true, you would expect the unions, the representative of the workers, would be all in favor of it. Uh, but it's the people who are in favor of it are the people like from Wall Street. Now, you can, know, you, you can bet that they are really concerned about working people. That's why they did all the things they did before 2008, and they continue to do those things. Uh, the U.S. trade representative, of course, comes from Citibank and uh, does not represent uh, workers or the typical American. Um, he represents uh, a group of uh, special interest. And that's why the only way that it's going to be defeated is if there's an outpouring of concern um, and uh, the kind of activist uh, action uh, that this kind of meeting uh, uh, represents. There are two parts of the debate, and uh, the first part is the fast track authority, uh, and beyond the fast track is the debate about what the content of these trade agreements uh, is. I want to talk about the, fa about the fast track uh, first. Um, I was down in the Senate yesterday, and, and uh, one of the senators said, you know, uh, he got elected to make decisions, not to send a, sign a basically a blank check to, to the administration to negotiate, to, to uh, 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 decide what is good for the American people. And that's what fast track is, but it's actually much worse than a blank check about trade. And that was the point that was just raised. Because the trade agreement, the trade agreement has provisions that would affect a whole set of regulations 
that affect the environment, worker safety, consumer safety, and even the economy. And this trade agreement, done fast track without any amendment, would then not only become the law of the land, but every one of our other laws would have to adapt to it. And our Congress would have given up all authority in those areas. And so we should be concerned about what's in there. Now, as was pointed out, uh, there's a great deal of secrecy. But the good news, in a way, is that uh, everything leaks in the United States. <laughs> and uh, we have uh, some uh, good civil groups that like Wikipedia, uh, 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 WikiLeaks, that have been telling us what has been going on. And if it's anything near uh, what WikiLeaks is saying, and it's interesting, there's very little denial that what, it, what they're saying, uh, then the reason for being concerned is, is truly uh, very serious. It's also interesting that the USTR is not even allowing some members of Congress to see what's inside the agreement. So it's not only that we as citizens can't see, but some members of Congress. At one point, they didn't even allow the chairman of the relevant committee in the Senate to see it. And of course, that was a political mistake because uh, he got angry. And one of the reasons why it hasn't progressed uh, as well as it would have hoped is uh, this issue of secrecy. Well, when you have issues of secrecy like that, the natural question is, why? What are they trying to hide? If it's something that's really good for the American people, uh, and if you believe in democracy, certainly shouldn't you have an open debate, try to convince them, and try to reach an agreement, not about every detail, we don't expect there to be, you know, there's going to be negotiation, but we ought to at least understand some of the basic principles that are going into this agreement. Uh, but they won't disclose that except, as was pointed out, to some members of the business community who are basically negotiating for their interest, but not for the interest of most Americans. But let me talk a little bit about what are some of the uh, issues, some of the contents of the agreement, and why it, it is and ought to be very controversial. The first, I'll just talk about a little bit about jobs. Because this agreement is not like most other agreements. Most other agreements in the past have been one country lowers its tariffs, the other country lowers its tariffs. There's an expansion of exports, an expansion of imports, and uh, uh, that's what they are. They're, they're, they're uh, negotiations to lower tariffs on both sides. This is not what this agreement is about. It's really about undermining the regulations that affect the environment, health, safety, food, everything. And it's about medicine, intellectual property, access to generic mes medicines, access to affordable medicines. So let me talk about first the, the jobs issues and then talk about the, the, um, uh, uh, the, environment, the, the regulatory issues and then finally talk very briefly about the, uh, uh, the, the, the intellectual property and the health care, the health issues. On the jobs, uh, discussion uh, just a minute ago about uh, the loss of jobs. In a way, this should not be a surprise when you think about it. Why would anybody else sign an agreement unless they thought there was going to be basically commensurate be benefits? So that basically, in a, in a global trade regime, if you export more, you also are going to wind up importing more. And that's what trade promotion is about. It's not a one-sided thing. Nobody would sign a one-sided agreement. Now, if exports create jobs, and that's what the U.S. Trade Representative Obama talked about, exports create jobs, imports destroy jobs. 
And since exports and imports roughly grow in commensurate, the real question is on net, are there more jobs created by the increase in exports than destroyed by the increase in imports? And increasingly, there's a recognition, even among the academics, even among those who have, were earlier supportive of, of free trade or trade expansion, there's an increasing recognition that today in the American economy, with a high level of unemployment, a labor force participation rate that's lower than it's been in decades, with weak wages, that we are in a situation where the job-destroying aspects of trade agreements is almost surely likely, likely to be greater than the job-creating aspects. And that's particularly true because the financial sector is not working the way it's supposed to. The financial sector is more interested in market manipulation, speculation, all kinds of activities than lending to new businesses, than to lending to create new jobs. And of course, even if there are opportunities of exports, if you can't get finance, you can't expand your business. It's easy to destroy jobs. It's hard to create them. And our economy has excelled in job destruction, but has not done as well in job creation. And when there's an imbalance between job creation and job destruction, such as there has been in the United States, wages fall. And so when you saw that dramatic graph where productivity continues to grow, but wages have stagnated for 30 years. Part of the reason is that the pace of job creation has not been as strong as is necessary for our economy. The numbers are actually even worse for different parts of our economy, for different groups in our economy. For instance, to pick out one that is probably overly represented in this room, males, the income of a full, median income adjusted for inflation of a full-time male worker today is lower than it was 40 years ago. Now an economy that doesn't deliver for most citizens, where most citizens see their income stagnate or fall year after year is an economy that is not working. And so all this stuff about free trade leading to higher incomes, it has led to higher incomes for the 1%. But it hasn't led to higher incomes for the other 99%. So that's the first argument, the, the, the first area, which is, is, is jobs and wages. But as I said, this is not about jobs and wages. This is about other things. Now, the part of the agreement that is uh, connect, uh, uh, related to, to the regulations that guide our economy, make our economy function, are the is a provision called an investment agreement. Now, what gives lie to what this is about is uh, the U.S. government, the USTR, says this is to protect our property rights to protect the investors' property rights. And without that protection, there won't be investment. Well, the U.S. is trying to get a similar agreement to the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, across the Atlantic with Europe. And in that agreement, they're demanding the same investment provisions. Well, you can imagine what the reaction in Europe is, what the reaction in Germany and Spain they say, we thought we had good property protection. We thought we had good property rights. And they say, if something's wrong with our property rights, tell us, and we want to protect our own citizens, not just foreign investors. Why should we give foreign investors more protections than we do for our own citizens, which is what this agreement does? So that's why in Europe there is a outpouring of opposition to this part of the agreement, the investment agreement. Well, what this is, is an end run around Congress. Not only the fast track, but the contents of the agreement are an end run around Congress. 
because we need to have a congressional debate about each of the provisions, about environmental re regulations, about, about uh, uh, safety regulations, about uh, health regulations. But this agreement would tie our hands. It would tie the hands of our trading partners. So it is bad both for us and for them. And in Europe, they've begun to recognize that, and that's why there's such opposition. In America, we haven't yet fully grasped how this is tying our hands. So for instance, uh, we all know that we had an under-regulated financial sector before 2008. We all know the way that the financial sector uh, mismanaged risks, misallocated capital, engaged in market manipulation, abusive credit card practices, predatory lending, discriminatory lending. The list is long. In fact, uh, every day you still pick up the paper and their, 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 their new scandal gets exposed. In the wake of that, we passed Dodd-Frank, not as good a bill as we should have had, but it was better than nothing. But no one seems to have told the U.S. Trade Representative that we had a crisis in 2008. They don't seem to understand what happened. They don't understand that we needed to have stronger regulations. But this agreement would make it more difficult to have those regulations as we need it. As we find out something's not working. And the key provision was the mention, what was mentioned before. If you pass a regulation and the result of that regulation is that the profits were lower than you had expected, then you get compensated. Now let me give you another example that's even more outrageous and is something actually going on and should be an embarrassment to every American. Health regulations are very important and most of you know that that cigarettes are a major health hazard. I hope none of you smoke, but, but uh, uh, even if you do, you should realize that for your children and for others, that they represent a danger. And in the United States, we passed laws regulating, restricting advertising, restricting uh, 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 marketing of cigarettes. Other countries have taken stronger measures. In Australia, many other countries, they've insisted that the cigarette companies put a picture of what a lung that has been diseased by, by, by smoking does or, or heart disease. They've made very graphic because they want to tell people this is what cigarettes do. But under these provisions of the investment agreement, Philip Morris is suing Uruguay and Australia trying to strip away those regulations, regulations that health authorities all over the world say are great. The one good thing is that Bloomberg is actually paying for Uruguay's legal fees so it can battle Philip Morris. <laughs> because he has waged a, a battle here in New York to get better you know, against smoking, and he feels embarrassed by what is going on that the U.S. government is demanding that other countries open up their, their market to poisonous cigarettes. Their view is it's a basic right of Americans to kill other people. So uh, there was even a discussion earlier on of having a carve out to say, at least this is too embarrassing, but that hasn't happened. So this is a provision that's in the TPP right now, as far as we can tell from the leaked uh, documents. Uh, environmental regulations, the same thing. The similar kind of agreement that was in, in the Mexico, in, in the NAFTA, uh, gave rise to a suit. There was a town in, in Mexico that said it didn't like the idea of having a toxic waste dump in the middle of the city. And so it says, pass the regulation saying you can't have a toxic waste dump in the middle of the city. And they had to close it down. But then that company sued. It said, 
our expectations of profits are that we were going to run a, a nice dump, toxic dump in the middle of the city. And they won. And so the government has to compensate for passing regulations to protect the health, safety, environment. Now we had a discussion of this issue when I was in the Clinton administration. It's called regulatory takings. That is to say, do you have to compensate those who are poisoning our environment or hurting health or doing other things? Do you have to compensate them to stop them doing things that are hurting other people and hurting our environment? Now, most of you would say, you shouldn't have to compensate somebody for not killing somebody else. And there's been a long judicial tradition in the United States that says, that's right. You shouldn't have to compensate them for imposing regulations that protect our environment, our economy, our citizens in every way. So this is what's happened in the United States. When I was in the Clinton administration, we fought this. And we said, we, we can't, we, that you, you don't compensate people when you pass regulations for those purposes. So we won that victory, but at the same time that we were fighting that victory at home, we put in the trade agreement with Mexico and Canada a provision that undermined it and undermined what we were doing. And now, and now, this investment agreement is trying to extend that for that huge area of the TPP, and the U.S. government is trying to extend it to the, uh, to the uh, Atlantic. I mean, make clear that countries who have suffered under these agreements are fed up. That countries like South Africa that made a mistake and signed that have announced that they are canceling their agreements. Countries like India, Brazil do not have these agreements. Brazil has made it clear they would never sign an agreement like this. And yet we are imposing this, or trying to impose this, on countries all over the world. One of the problems, and just mention it very briefly, is that the judicial process, these investor state disputes, are done in secret, is standards of judicial processes that would be embarrassment in the 19th century, let alone in the 21st century. So that's the investment agreement that we're trying to stuff into this so-called trade agreement that represents not only a risk to our health, but a really risk to our democracy, because we are saying we can no longer pass these regulations anymore. And the final thing I want to mention just very briefly is the intellectual property provisions. Now, the word intellectual property, you know, I'm an academic, I produce books, uh, I produce intellectual property, and we all care about intellectual property, but that's not what this is about. Intellectual property is important for promoting innovation, but you need a balanced intellectual property regime. And what the USTR is promoting is not a balanced intellectual property regime. It's an intellectual property regime that is the interest of the entertainment industry, the pharmaceutical industry, and some other corporate interest. When I was again in the uh, Council of Economic Advisors, we in the Office of Science and Technology Policy opposed the intellectual property agreement that was put into the Uruguay Round in 1995 was called TRIPS. I then served on the, uh, in an international commission called the Social Dimensions of Globalization, and we said that, that what was needed was a pullback from that was called TRIPS minus rather than TRIPS plus. But unfortunately, what the USTR is trying to do now is to make it even worse. The big battle here, the, the most important part of the battle, there are many, many parts of this, but the, the single most important is the access to generic medicines. Generic medicines cost a fraction of what brand name medicines do. And we've worked out inside the United States a balance where we say you have a patent for 20 years and then it becomes free and then generics can come in. We have what's called the Hatch-Waxman Act that sort of reached a balance between generics and, and uh, brand name 
uh, in big pharma, so that today about 86% of all drugs are actually generics, and that's brought down the price. But the provisions of TPP are designed to make generics more difficult to get. It's really an onslaught by the big pharma against generics. And as some of you may have seen, and I, I wrote an op-ed in the New York Times, basically I said, I don't understand Obama. Because his signature initiative is Obamacare, bringing down health care costs. And this trade agreement will raise health care costs. And not only in developing, not, in the, not only in the other countries of TPP, but in the United States. The president has said, for instance, there's a very complicated provision called data exclusivity, which is designed to make it more difficult to, for generics to come in and to extend, extend the effect of patent life by another 12 years. And even President Obama has said inside the administration, he thinks that's wrong. It was, ought to be brought down. But his trade representative, USTR, doesn't seem to understand this. And he's been pushing for the full 12 years. Now, he was so embarrassed, I met with all the other health negotiators and, and, and uh, they, they, the, all the health negotiators, all the negotiators of TPP, except the United States came. And, and we talked about these health issues, and they uh, seemed very obviously concerned about them. And the result of that is they put an op-ed into a, an editorial into the Washington Post, and he said basically, oh, we don't think we're going to get 12 years. The question is, why are you negotiating for 12 years if you don't think, when, when the administration doesn't want 12 years, It will make it more difficult to get access to generics. And basically the question here is partly an issue of trust. Is he negotiating for 12 years, which everybody else thinks he is, or is he saying he's not negotiating? What is this all about? And that goes back to then the first issue, the secrecy and the delegation of democratic responsibility to, in the fast track that will basically short circuit the ability of the American people to participate in the real decisions that will be affecting them. So in conclusion, let me say this is a big deal. It will affect you. It will affect your pocketbook. It will affect your jobs. It will affect your regula regulation, the environment. It will affect our whole economy in terms of stability. And so while they're trying to get it in when nobody's paying attention, uh, hopefully meetings like this, uh, enough force will be brought and that uh, pressure will be brought to stop uh, TPP. Thank you. We have time to take a few questions. Oh, great. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Maybe staff here for the mic or you can use that one. It's a, it's a terrifying deal. It really is a frightening prospect for us. Uh, Professor Stiglitz has about a few minutes here to take some questions. Um, so I'm just going to uh, ask people to raise their hand, stand up, and project. Gentleman in uh, orange in the back there. Speak up real loud, sir. Thanks, I'm Billy Engel from Local 3 IPW. Right now, the mainstream media is not focused on this. Obama's chief of staff, brother of CBS News Bureau Chief Brother. How do we get the mainstream media to really focus on this? Because usually the press is really involved in this. How is this, I mean, they're investing in this. How do we get the press involved, the mainstream, the mainstream media before we lose it all? Yeah. Well, I think, I think as it's becoming a national issue, you, the press will, will begin to focus upon it. Uh, the, and the question, the real question here is the race, uh, to, to be quite, quite frankly. That if they can get it through before the pr everybody focuses on it, that's what they hope. 
and then it'll be too late. And so, really, the attempt here is, and that's why I wrote the op-ed in the in the in the in the New York Times. Uh, other people are writing. And what's also interesting, though, is opposition is mounting all through the TPP areas. Uh, that particularly, uh, in many many countries, this health issue, access to health, is becoming a very very important one. We're a rich country. If a lot of the countries in TPP are not that rich, and the what will happen if if this provision goes through, people will, will die and budgets will be broken. So it's, for them, it's an even bigger issue than it is for the United States. Uh, yes, ma'am, right there in the blue vest. My name is Janet O'Hare. My question simply is, why is our government doing this? <laughs> that's, that's actually not a very complicated question. Uh, uh, I, and, and maybe you can have a view too, but I, I think it's, it's just the standard issue of moneyed interest, special interest, uh, of trying to get what is good for them. And uh, campaign contributions are, you know, the word contribution sounds like a donation. These are not donations, these are investments. And they get a higher return from these investments than they do from almost any other thing. So in financial sector was a real example where if you looked at their, their financial investments, they were a disaster. You look at their campaign contributions, their returns from that have been enormous. Wow. So, so uh, I think that's it. Uh, to make it, to bring it out more clearly, in some administrations, the U.S. trade representatives, like our trade minister, actually was the campaign manager for the president. Now, it wasn't like he brought to the table enormous expertise in trade theory, intellectual property, uh, in, uh, intellect, in, in, in pr pro pro legal protection of property rights, you know, those are difficult issues, but that wasn't what he, you know, he wasn't appointed for that expertise that he was bringing to the table. He was brought there because his job was to pay back some of the contributions that had been received. Uh, yes, sir, in that gray sweater. How you doing? Good evening. Uh, my name is Eddie Rosario. I'm with uh, Ask Me Local 375 of DC 37. Um, some of us remember the multilateral agreement on investments that was uh, defeated along with the free trade agreement of, uh, of, of the Americas. But subsequently, we've seen all these regional free trade pacts uh, in addition to NAFTA, CAFTA. Um, uh, there's a whole host of, of these free trade agreements. Um, as you recall, the MAI, MAI they were global capital was trying to get basically one clean swoop the whole global, global economy under one free trade agreement, but that failed. Would you, wouldn't you say that now we're essentially being spoon-fed the MAI agreement by agreement? That's right. Now, let me just remind you, I, I, I was chief economist at the World Bank, and I've often looked at these questions from the perspective of the developing con economies. And uh, let me tell it, you know, uh, these agreements are bad both for the United States and for the developing economy, and that's why they went down in defeat. Uh, for instance, one of the important things for a developing economy is if you have foreign investors come in, you want to be able to get those foreign investors to train your workers so that you can become more self-reliant in the future. These agreements did not allow that. So they were an attempt to sort of make sure that the foreign investor could continue to dominate your economy. Now for the American economy, there are now a whole other set of issues of the kind that I talked about on, on uh, financial regulation, environment, safety, food safety, you know, a, a whole set of, of issues. Um, and we're beginning to realize since we, People didn't realize how bad these agreements were when they were first put in the agreements back 25 years ago. We are now getting the experience of what's going on. We've seen the kind of suits uh, that have gone on. Um, South Africa tried 
uh, it was important for South Africa, for instance, in the aftermath of the legacy of apartheid, to try to make sure that there was an affirmative action program to bring up the Africans who had been so badly discriminated. They got sued under this agreement. So these agreements are really curtailing the ability of countries to pursue their social goals. And it's putting the primacy of corporate interests above everything else. And so, and you're absolutely right, when, when everybody was together, everybody could see how bad they were. And now what it's, what's, the, the, the advantage the United States sees is that what it does is, you, you use the word spoon feed, what it does is negotiates with a group of much weaker economies and they keep saying, well, we need the protection of the United States if, if, uh, for military purposes or we're going to, we need to access to American markets. And it's all based on a hope that if they sign one of these agreements, there'll be a flood of investment. The evidence is they don't even get more investment out of this. They get weakened protections, but they don't even get more investment, which is why Brazil has, re, you know, Brazil actually studied the issue. South Africa studied the issue. And that's why Brazil refuses to sign one and South Africa says, we're not gonna, we're, gonna we're, we're, we're canceling our agreements and, you know, maybe we can find someone that would work, but not the ones that are being pushed by the US uh, TR. One other point I should mention, at the beginning of the Obama administration, uh, there was a discussion of these investment agreements. You know, they've been very controversial. People were very upset. So he brought together a commission of civil society and corporate interest. And I don't know if you know what happened to that? They couldn't reach an agreement because civil society said uh, the only agreement that the corporate interests were interested in was unacceptable. So the commission broke down, in effect, and then who did Obama go with? Rather than going with the version that the civil society said, okay, you know, there's some things, there's some things you, you could talk about, didn't go with their version, it went with the version that the corporate interests were in, you know, in favor. Very disturbing to me. Thank you, it's very scary. So um, we're going to take two more quick questions. Please limit your remarks. And I'm also going to ask the speakers who are addressing specific aspects of the treaty and how it would affect people here to come on up. Uh, remember, we want to get to the action part of actually stopping this agreement. Uh, so we'll move quickly from here. Uh, so yes, ma'am, with the glasses and yeah. Yeah, I'm a reporter. We all do that. My question is, you mentioned the environment. What would be the most serious risk of this to environment? Okay. Well, basically, every regulatory, every regulation of the environment is at risk. And as we discover new environmental risks, they are the ones that are particularly at risk. Because basically what it says is, if you go into the United States, make an investment, and then we discover there's a new hazard that we hadn't realized. We didn't realize that fracking was a hazard. You pass a regulation to stop it, you have to be compensated so that, and this is the words that he brought up, the, the, the company that bought the land and the expectation of making the profits would have to be fully compensated as if it had taken out all the oil and gas from the fracking. That's really unbelievable. Yes, sir, last question. From your point of view, how, detriment, up, how detrimental or beneficial has been NAFTA for Mexico? Ah, that's a good question. Uh, the question was, if there, how beneficial or detrimental has NAFTA been for Mexico? Well, the evidence was for the first, basically, uh, the, the NAFTA was passed in 1994 for the first the U.S. trade rep is... Uh, <laughs> uh, for the first 15 or 20 years, it was hard to detect any benefits. And the reason was, and, and this is a general uh, point, that the Mexican government thought that 
a trade agreement was a solution to its problems. And it's not. You aren't going to be able to compete if you don't have good roads, if you don't have good infrastructure, good education system, good technology. And they prayed that the trade agreement was all they needed. And to some extent, that's the same problem the United States faces. We aren't investing in infrastructure, we're not investing in education, we're not doing all the other things that we should be doing. And so the president somehow thinks that a trade agreement is going to solve our problems. It won't. And it could actually make things worse. So in that initial period, it was very hard to see any benefits. One could see some costs. There were concerns that, for instance, poor Mexican farmers were going to have to compete with highly subsidized American corn. So there are some problems that even they faced. More recently, there is a little glimmer that maybe finally some benefits may be, may be coming um, because uh, the, 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 the competition from China is weakening because the exchange rate in China has gone up, wages in China, and so the, the change in the global context may make it uh, a little bit better. But even then, what we have to remember, the tariffs were always very low. That, that wasn't the main reason why Mexico wasn't exporting to the United States. And that's really the important thing. The trade agreements are fundamentally not that much about trade. And the new trade agreements are even less so. That's right. So uh, I want to be very conscious of Professor Siglitz's time. I know he has an important appointment coming up. And I just wanted to thank you again and ask for another round of applause for Professor Siglitz for coming. Thank you so, so very much. Uh, our next speaker, and I'm going to ask each of our folks here to speak very, very quickly, is Freddy Castablanco. Uh, I just want to make sure you read this. Congressman Crowley, he's not here, but you know about this. We, the small business in New York, have been undermined by the unfair competition that allows the chain stores to brutally expand while their products are made with slaves' hands. Locally, this trend is, is sponsored by policies that seek tax exemptions for developers while subject the inversion on our streets to the creations of new taxes on property, rising our rents. At the national level, the deficit in manufacturing output driven by free trade agreements like the Korea entitles the loss of diversity of local economies and the ability to generate products that meet local demands for consumers increasingly concerned about the environment and its sustainability. A true economic recovery from the bottom depends on small businesses and cooperatives. Let's all remember small businesses are more likely to develop emerging technologies than larger firms, with 16 times more patents per employee than the larger firms. Small businesses accounted for 60% of new jobs creation. If TTP, TPP were approved, local policies for a true economic recovery will receive lawsuits in international courts if corporations consider that this might reduce their profit. The litigation against our communities will undermine citizens' initiative, initiative, initiative as those that seek to encourage the consumption of local products defend the democratization of credit, advocate for the protection of water source from fracking, seek to rise wages, recall products that are harmful to the public health, seek to control the skyrocketing rent and limit the expansion of business improvement districts in our community. Finally, Congressman Crowley, we wonder, without public debate, without public hearing with citizens and scientific experts, and even worse, without knowing exactly what you are going, going to vote uh, uh, for, what is the legitimacy of this Congress? In this vote, if this vote goes via fast track, we can assure you 
the dream for democracy of over 320 million American citizens will die in the desktop of those representatives of 600, 600 corporations who wrote the TPP. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Freddie. And Freddie is the owner of Terrazza 7 and is also with the uh, Roosevelt Avenue Community Alliance. I'm just going to pass the mic here, I think might be the easiest way to do this. Um, oh, you come up? Okay. All right. So uh, Stephanie Lowe and Eric Weltman are from the Sierra Club and Food and Water Watch. Hello, everybody. Hello. Uh, thank you all so much for coming. I'm so delighted to see so many people here. Who here, who, who of us, remember, knows the word fracking? <laughs> Woo, yeah, great. Oh, A plus for all of us. OK, so um, how many of us know uh, that Governor Cuomo just declared a ban on fracking a couple of weeks ago? <laughs> Woo! <laughs> a double plus. OK, the next question is a little harder. How many of us know that if, fast track, if the fast track bill passes, and allows the TPP to slide through Congress without any amendments, our fracking ban could be reversed by Ooh. any multinational corporation that wants to make a lot of money fracking in New York State. Did you know that? I, I only know that because I've been working on this for two and a half years. Actually, this sort of thing is already happening under the rules of NAFTA, a fracking company in Canada wants to frack under the St. Lawrence River, which, is, uh, which provides drinking water to hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, the Canadian government is understandably worried about losing this source of clean water, so it declared a moratorium on fracking. But this little fracking company, it's named Lone Pine, was clever enough to incorporate its business in the United States in order to take advantage of the NAFTA rule that allows a single corporation to rise to the level of a nation state and bring a lawsuit in international court against the country it wants to do its unregulated business in. So this little fracking company, Lone Pine, Lone Pine, I think it stands for the one tree that's going to be standing after they finish fracking. <laughs> yeah. Lone Pine is suing the country of Canada for its moratorium on fracking in order not to lose what it calls, as, as it, several people have already mentioned, its expected future profits. If it wins, if the Lone Pine wins, the taxpayers of Canada will have to pay a $250 million fine and figure out some other way to get clean water. Um, that's how NAFTA works. The TPP has been called NAFTA on steroids, as you all know because it uses the same outrageous end run around the lawful protections of any country that signed on to this agreement in the first place. Maybe they didn't read the small print, you know, I don't know why. Uh, but listen, NAFTA is only three countries. The TPP is 12 countries. It, I, I think I've done everything I'm supposed to do. Um, it's, uh, we don't want this, right? Right. So, what, what can we do about it? There's a simple way to stop it. Call Representative Crowley's office first thing tomorrow morning and say to whoever answers, I want Congressman Crowley to vote against the fast track bill. I want him to protect our community. Please let me know how he plans to vote and leave your phone number. And if we all act together, we can make sure our water, air, food, health, are protected. Are you with me? Yes. yes, thank you. Good evening. My name is Eric Weltman, and I'm a senior organizer with Food and Water Watch. We helped win the ban on fracking in New York and now working to label genetically engineered or GMO foods. Food and Water Watch's mission is to champion healthy food and water for all. You wouldn't think that a trade agreement would be a concern of ours. But this is no ordinary trade agreement. The Trans-Pacific Partnership threatens the safety of the food we eat, the water we drink, and the air we breathe. The TPP puts this all at risk by authorizing foreign corporations to sue federal, state, and local governments 
if a company believes that a law or regulation would negatively affect its bottom line. This is a legal system known as investor state equivalency. It's about global harmonization and equivalence of standards, what we call a race to the bottom. It's about deregulation that trumps corporate interests over public health, safety, and the environment. We won't stand for it. Our allies won't stand for it. You won't stand for it. And we're hopeful, we're hopeful that, Go that Congressman Crowley will continue to be a leader in opposing, fast-tracking the TPP. I just want to mention that the phone number for Congressman Crowley is on a sheet of paper that you all should have received going in. So, as Stephanie said, please make sure to call Congressman Crowley tomorrow and urge him to say no to fast track, no to the TPP. Thanks, Eric. Uh, Mijin Richard is with uh, CAV, Organizing Asian Communities. Good evening. Um, so again, I'm with CAV, representing CAV, organizing Asian communities. We're a racial and economic justice organization. Um, our office is located in Chinatown. And um, I'm here because I'm also representing today, or CAV is a part of a coalition called, a, called API People Solidarity. And we are opposing the TPP. Um, we are not only opposing the TPP, we actually see the TPP as one piece of a larger um, pivot, what the U.S. is calling a pivot to the Asia-Pacific region. And so not just getting, working to build economic power in the region um, to combat China's rising, power, rising economic power, but also a shifting of U.S. military um, of U.S. military into the region. And so we understand that um, the, the, the U.S. is not able to obtain economic power and political power without also having military power. And so the three things come as a package. Um, and let me go back to my notes. Um, the TPP is opposed by working class Asian Americans here in the United States and also workers in, in Asia. Um, we know that five of the 12 countries right now that are part of the agreement um, are located in the Asia Pacific region, or in, in Asia. Um, and we also know from history, some of, uh, a couple of folks talked about it, the Korea-US free trade agreement um, did not actually create jobs as it had promised. Um, and it forced deregulation and made conditions for workers um, even more precarious. So uh, Koreans and allies opposed, who opposed uh, the Korea-US free trade agreement back then are also going, like we have been active and we will continue to be active in um, standing and opposing the TPP as it comes about. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. I, I think Mijin raises an incredible point. Uh, the Obama administration and the powers that be are selling this partly as a national security issue, as if we should be afraid of China and the Chinese. It's very important that everyone here realize that this is a global solidarity issue. This doesn't just hurt American people, American workers, the American environment, it hurts uh, workers overseas as well. And whenever national security is invoked as justification for public policy, watch out. Uh, our next speaker is Jessica Ramos from the New Visions Democratic Club. Hi, everyone. Hi. My very first job ever was on Roosevelt Avenue and 83rd Street, working for a law firm that actually is still there. And it was a very interesting time. Um, I was there for when the 2003 uh, immigration law was passed to help undocumented immigrants who had either crossed the Mexican border or who had overstayed their visas pay a penalty, marry an American citizen, and be able to qualify to apply for, for, um, for a green card, for per permanent resident status. And so in 2003, we started seeing here in Jackson Heights, actually, many, many people from the Mexican community come um, and, and, and find and make their home here, right here in Jackson Heights. 
And these are, have been an amazing group of people, among them so many entrepreneurs and hardworking people who had been displaced from Mexico because of NAFTA and have actually um, made, made these incredible small businesses along a very important economic corridor here in Jackson Heights, uh, which is Roosevelt Avenue. You may have, those of you who aren't from here, uh, may have seen it uh, getting here because it's right under, under the 7 train. And um, many of these small business uh, owners actually um, are about to be in a very precarious position due to a business improvement district that is being proposed to expand, uh, to expand right here in Jackson Heights from an existing one along 82nd Street. And I mention it and you're probably wondering, well how does this micro thing relate to this very huge, global, terrible free trade agreement. And sometimes we forget that immigration is a part of this, A. And B, these are also both things that have very harmful and, 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 and important impacts on our daily lives, right? And they're both being negotiated and talked about very secretively. And so I want to be able to highlight that um, as, a, as a member of Jackson Heights, as Congressman Crowley's constituent, that we should be very, very careful about economic initiatives that change your livelihood, um, that you know, um, force people to leave their homes and have to make a decision. Um, and people should have to immigrate because they want to, not because they have to, not because they're forced um, by people who want to take away economic opportunity and wealth opportunity from, from us, from the 99% that Professor Stiglitz was speaking about. And so I want to urge you all to please join me as, as Congressman Crowley's constituents to call, to email, to go to that office and ask him to vote against fast-tracking this free trade agreement and any free trade agreement for that matter. He's done it before and he should do it again. Thank you so much, Jessica. Our uh, next speaker uh, is Malu Wahuka del Toro from Somos Los Otros, New York por Ayotzinapa. And as many of you may know, uh, drug gangs and narco trafficking is a major problem in this country. It's an even more violent problem in Mexico due to U.S. demand, uh, as well as other reasons. Um, and she's going to tell us about uh, the recent massacre and how much of this is connected to NAFTA and our global trade agreements. Uh, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thanks for staying. The reason I'm, I'm coming here with my group is because for us, this is a, a very matter of life and death for us. The TPP it, it makes us really fear for our lives, and I'm going to explain why. And they took the time to, talk, to come here to, to, to be with me and, and tell us, tell you whatever they, they want to say because they are very worried about the TPP. And I'm going to explain why we're so worried. NAFTA was the first experiment of these secret trade deals which don't represent the people's will and are signed without popular consensus. This is very important. Um, if you sign the TPP with the Mexican President Peña Nieto, you will be cutting a deal with someone who does not represent the will of the people, both in Mexico and the United States, and especially in Queens with a heavy pop Mexican population now. And I, I say that, I say this for sure because I was part of a movement who opposed NAFTA. We, the Mexican people, fought against NAFTA as well. We were a growing movement. Well, people told, told, wanted to stigmatize us, saying, oh, you want to go medieval, you don't want trade. How can we not want trade? Of course we want trade. What we wanted was to let us know what you are signing and to have a say in that trade. So we, when we asked, let us know what you are signing, the fast track was invented for the first time, which is what we are fighting right now. 
And to us, fast track means in secret. Today, we are suffering the consequences of that secret deal. Millions of Mexican peasants were forced to sell their lands and escape to work in sweatshops in urban areas controlled by the organized crime in Mexico, or else to cross the border to become cheap labor in the United States, working in services and living in Queens, for instance. We are the group Zapatista Solidarity Network and somos los otros New York for an Ayotzinapa. We are the other New York fighting for uh, for Ayotzinapa. We are fighting against the organized crime inside the government, which is destroying public education, killing teachers. Just yesterday, the federal police killed more teachers in Guerrero, another teacher. Aside from the Ayotzinapa uh, students killed five months ago, allowing, allowing more deregulated hotels and casinos which means more organized crime, signing the secret deals just to expand the power of corporations and the illegal Mexican money laundering in Wall Street and banks like the HSBC. Congressman Crowley, this is our message. Many of us in this group, some of los otros, New York, live in Queens, we live in Queens and we ask you to honor the land of the Flushing remonstrance promoted by the Quakers, which was the origin of the famous American First Amendment, and let the newcomers of today, the Mexican people, to stay alive, let alone free, alive. Because this TPP deal is against the Mexican people, both in New York City and Mexico. Don't sign that deal with the traitors of both Mexico and the United States. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, it's a, it's a vital point, and we're asking everyone at the end of this, uh, at the end of this program, and we'll be done within the next 10, 15 minutes, to please go with these folks and take a picture uh, to show solidarity uh, with Mexican workers. Make no mistake that the kind of stuff that's happening here is played back overseas as well. Uh, so please, please do that if you have a moment. Uh, he has a, a very short message. You know, I'm just going to stick to okay, the... Okay, sure. thank you. Yep. Thank you so much. So our next speaker is Leandro Araqueña from Peru Peruvians in Action. Oh, here you are. Great. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, Good evening. I'm, I'm Leandro Araqueña from Peruvians in Action. Uh, the reason I came here, Adam Weisman, who uh, was working very hard some long years ago, working against the trade agreements. The trade agreements bring us from, like, uh, I'm going to talk about my country, how the destruction is starting since the trade agreements started. The trade agreements for me brings poverty, destruction, migration. Poverty, I came here 30 years ago. When I started the globalization, I start under the table because the money, it doesn't, you can, you can get money if you don't work. You work if you have a job, but the job is outside, for our, our uh, overseas. How can we can go to work? Many people is around in the corner looking for job. People under migration, We've, we are forcing to come in this country because many countries like Mexico, Peru, Ecuador, Bolivia, from every place, from Europe, they come in because here is the American dream. Some of us, we get American dream, some of us a nightmare. But we stay here because we have family. Our, we have kids and our kids love this country since they born here and then we decide to stay here and to fight and to know what's going on around here. In my country, there is a place, Cajamarca, a beautiful place that was from the oldest um, Incas. When they said, you are poor, but you are sitting in the, in the chair of gold. That's true. That was true. Cajamarca is the biggest place from the world. Has 
the mining it doesn't finish, it's continue, but it makes destruction for the people. People was poisoned with the water, was poisoning their lands because they don't have apartment like us, a TV, the TV is the mountains, the natural view. What they have it now, just sadness, death, because those animals, they can drink that poison water with Sianduro, how come you can live? And the, the kids, is starting with some different sickness they didn't know. Yes, they know, <coughs> but they keep it. I'm going to just finish because I see that I'm stop. Just, please, TPP, we are not be allowing here. If you allow it, it's going to continue in our country because in our country we say, United States sign that. How come we can do it? Please, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much. And people should keep in, folks should keep in mind that the special places that she's talking about, uh, there has been litigation against the government of Peru under trade agreements to compensate uh, for Peruvian government action to stop the poisoning of their land. Then the ma mining company sues and the Peruvian government has to fold under the trade agreement. That's the kind of thing that we're talking about here happening in the United States and more overseas. Um, our last speaker is uh, Carlos Salamanca from Polo, Polo Demarcativo Alternativo, New York. Good evening. Corporate power is enormous and it is representatives in the executive, legislative and judicial at the federal levels along with the media continue to support the increase of the corporate economic and political power. This is what the President Obama seeks with the Trans-Pacific Partnership and the Free Trade Agreement with Europe. Occupy Wall Street uncover this reality for all in the world to see what's going on in the United States. Five years ago, the Supreme Court declared that corporations were people as well. And a popular response from critics states, we won't be convinced that corporations are people until Texas execute one of them. <laughs> Corporations are widening their political and judicial influence as the New York Times denounced in a three-page article on Wednesday, October 29, 2014, titled, Lovage's Beating Get for Swiss State Attorney General, meaning corporations are looking to end and curtail corruption and law violation investigation by paying for the election of the state attorney general in every state in the United States. Colombia signed the free trade agreement in two years ago. The first day, the first year, sorry, this, the government started receiving $1 billion in taxes that the corporation of the United States is supposed to pay. And who paid that $1 billion? The people with the new taxes inside of the country. And two, the first year, the 40% of the agrarian market was took for the big agribusiness of the United States. But unfortunately, we have for the first time two big agrarian strikes. The producer and the peasant in, the, in Colombia had two year consecutive strikes against the government denouncing the free trade agreement with, negotiated with the United States. Oh. <laughs> Colombia, traditional unionists continue to be assassinated. Until now, more than 3,000 union members were killed because their activity as a union member. 20 in 2012, 26 in 2013. The destruction of the union organization is massive 
doing the growth of the subcontracting cooperatives that eliminate the ties between workers and their companies. The workers' work day shift has been extended from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. to avoid pay extra time. The dominical and festivity days are paying the same as a regular days, and pensions are almost impossible in the American neo-colony called Colombia. In order to approve the STA, Congress in Washington and to present, present the Labor Action Plan. And we need to say this, Crowley is not doing his job. He's supposed to be part of this and monitoring what's going on with the Action Plan. And in order to finish, the Colombians work against the STA with the United States, Colombia, Korea, Peru, and Panama. We lost, but we learned a lot, and we need to say that we had the solidarity with the union members and the union of the United States. Now we need to defeat the fast track and the TPT. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, you know, CWA and other unions, we fought very, very hard against the Colombia Free Trade Agreement and other agreements. A gentleman earlier mentioned the MAI, that was killed. The Doha round of the WTO never went anywhere. Some free trade agreements passed. The Colombian free trade agreement was justified partly on the grounds that, well, sure, they threaten and kill a lot of union people in Colombia, um, but you know what, that'll be reduced under this trade agreement. That's literally the kind of thing that they use as a justification, that, oh, we're killing less people, therefore it's a good free trade agreement. It's incredible. Um, so we're to the point in our agenda here where we want to say what we need to do. Um, Representative Crowley has voted against Fast Track in the past. He's on the Ways and Means Committee, so he is a crucial, crucial vote as a member of House leadership and a respected voice in the House Democratic Caucus. There are a lot of Republicans on the House side who are actually going to vote against this Fast Track agreement. The large majority of Republicans are going to go, go vote for it. But there is a Tea Party wing and some other Republicans who are going to vote against Fast Track and are committed to do that. On the Democratic side, in order to win, we need to hold virtually every Democrat. That's why it's so important that Representative Crowley come out right now as one of the last few representatives from New York State who hasn't declared his opposition to Fast Track legislation. He will send an important message to everyone else. So, um, the Working Families Party has been spearheading a door-to-door -door canvas here and has uh, been uh, collecting, uh, giving out uh, uh, flyers as you come in. Um, those folks from CWA right back there, Joe and Ray, are collecting handwritten letters uh, to Representative Crowley, which we'll present to him. So if you have not written a letter yet in this room, please take a moment as you go out to write a letter with Joe and Ray right over there in red, big guys waving at you right now. They want to write a letter with you um, to Representative Crowley about how important this issue is. A um, couple other things. The flyer has the phone number for Representative Crowley's office. Please call that. Call it again. Call it again. Please be respectful. He has stood on the right side of these issues in the past. We want him to do that uh, uh, again. Um, there's a big vote coming up, and he needs to come out against it. Um, last couple points here. Um, there are signs available with a big red uh, slash over TPP. Two things to do with those signs. One is take a picture as you go out holding the sign. We'll put it up on social media. And the second thing is take a sign and put it in your window so that everyone will see it in the neighborhood. Um, and with that, I just want to say how tremendous this turnout has been on a cold night in winter on an obscure issue that is now gaining the light that needs to be shed on it. Thank you so much for coming. Together we're going to win on this issue.